I'm Matt McLaughlin. This is Living History. A state which will live in infamy. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Well, may we say God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. There's a second plane just crashed into the World Trade Center. I think we have a terror attack. This was our final tower. Hello everyone, welcome to this week's instalment of Living History, coming to you from a very rainy spring day in Sydney, and today there's no interviews, there's no walking around historic sites, it's just me talking to you about a very historic date, because this is a date very close to my heart. Last week was the centenary of the Battle of Mont Brahan, and for anyone that knows their history really well, Mont Brahan's a bit of an obscure one, but it was actually the last battle that the Australians fought on the Western Front. It took place on the 5th of October, 1918. So relatively early, a long time, you know, five or six weeks before the end of the war. Um, And it's not very well known, this battle, but it should be better known than it was. Only of small action, especially considering what the Australians had done up to that point. But a very important one, the the last Australian operation uh, on the Western Front during the First World War. And so really, to me, It's always been a really important battle because the journey that began on the shores of Anzac Cove in 1915 when the AAF landed and fought at Gallipoli really ended at Mont Brahan more than three years later. And so it's a really special spot. It's an interesting battle. I'd recommend if you go to the battlefields, you certainly check it out. Not a lot of people get there. It's a long way to the east of the famous battlefields on the Somme, but it's really worth checking out. So I'd, I'd highly recommend you go there if, you, uh, if you're heading over to the battlefields of the Western Front. So I thought I'd take a few minutes today to just tell you a little bit more about Mont Brahan, a battlefield very close to my heart and a story that I think you will really enjoy. There's great Australian achievement in this story, but also quite a strong element of tragedy. And so I think you'll enjoy this next 20 minutes or so just hearing about the Battle of Mont Brahan. And please feel free to contact me with any questions you have about this battle or any comments about the centenaries in general, or anything else to do with military history. I'd really love to hear from you. So the Battle of Mont Brahan, what was it all about? Well, I think let's let's go back a little bit. Let's go back even to late 1917, which really sets the stage for everything that occurred in 1918. I should add at this point that I think 1918 was not just the most important year of the First World War for Australia, but probably our most important year in our military history. We did things in 1918 that we would never have dreamed of at the start of the war. Australia became an absolutely ferocious fighting force and was used, along with the Canadians, as the spearhead of the British attacks in 1918, which really played a vital role in ending the war. So I think 1918 was definitely our most important military year, and I would encourage everyone to read a bit more about it. We tend to overlook it. We look at the Somme in 1916. We obviously look at Gallipoli in 1915. We look at Passchendaele and Bulacore in 1917 and all the fighting in the Ypres salient. And then 1918, we talk about Villas Bretno, we talk about the German Spring Offensive, a couple of other actions like Hamel and perhaps Mons and Quentin, but then all of a sudden the war just seems to disappear and, 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 and ends fairly swiftly in our recollection of it. But it, it, abs- it absolutely wasn't the case. And the war went on um, with fighting right up until the very last days. For the Australians, those last days were in October, but for the rest of the Allies, fighting up until the very morning of November 11, when the war came to an end. So how, how did we get to 1918? What was going on that led to this situation and to Mont Brahan in particular? Well, let's go back to the end of 1917. And the first big thing that occurred was the Russian Revolution. And if you want more information about this, also um, listen to my podcast I did last week from uh, my interview with Peter Hart where he was talking about the final days of 1918 because he paints a really a really moving picture of what was going on in those late stages of the war. So at the end of 1917, the Russians, the Russian Revolution occurred, the royal family was overthrown, the Bolsheviks took over, they would later become the communists, and the first thing they did was make peace with the Germans. Um, and what this enabled the Germans to do was to take hundreds of thousands of troops, more than half a million troops, who had been fighting the Russians on the Eastern Front, and move them west to the Western Front. So this gave the Germans all of a sudden a huge numerical advantage on the Western Front for the first time during the war. But there was a trade-off because at the same time that the Germans were moving huge numbers of troops over, the Americans became a factor in the war for the first time. Now, the Americans, when they joined the war, had very few men. I think there was only something like 100,000 men in the US Army when they declared war in April 1917. But throughout 1917, they began training men and shipping them over. 
And by 1918, they were really starting to build up quite a formidable force on the Western Front. Now, everyone knew that by the summer of 1918, America would make a decisive difference to the war. And the Germans knew it especially. They knew there was no way, even with the extra troops they had from the Eastern Front, they knew there was no way they could win the war with the huge influx of literally millions of troops that the Americans were going to send over. So the Germans knew if they had to do anything to win the war, they had to do it quickly and take a risk, take a calculated risk, roll the dice and do what they could to win the war. And so in the spring of 1918, they took all these new troops they'd brought in from the Eastern Front and they launched what is now known as the German Spring Offensive. And this was a series of battles which took place in several parts along the line, against mostly against the British forces and a little bit against the French as well. And the Germans were quite successful tactically at driving bulges into the Allied lines, into salience. Um, they, they, were, they did quite well at, at using new tactics and quite, quite innovative tactics, and, and a lot of these tactics would be followed up and, and developed and lead to Blitzkrieg in the Second World War. But even though it was quite tactically effective, it lacked cohesion, the German Spring Offensives, and even though it drove the Allies back in a number of places, there was no overriding strategic plan and the Germans found themselves having pushed these big bulges into the Allied lines, but not uh, not achieving the majority of their objectives. And what this meant was having these big bulges in the Allied lines meant that they were ripe for a counterattack. And that's what took place later in 1918. And the Australians were very heavily involved in this. This whole period of time collectively became known as the 100 days, the advance that ended the war, that uh, that pushed the Germans back and back and back and, and kept them falling back every day and unable to mount uh, a defence and led to the defeat of the German army in the field. Listen again to Peter Hart's discussion last week where we talk about the defeat of the German army. Don't believe any of the stuff you've heard that the Germans were stabbed in the back, that they could have kept fighting. The German army was soundly defeated on the field of battle during the First World War, and that occurred during the 100 days. And Australia played a very uh, prom- prominent role during that uh, period of time. So going back over the 100 days, because that leads very neatly to what we're talking about at Mont Brahan, Really, the, the battle that set the stage was the Battle of Hamel on the 4th of July. Now, I've got to say, as Aussies, we tend to overplay the significance of Hamel. I mean, there were books published this year. One of them even said how it changed the course of history, the Battle of Hamel. And that is a little bit overblown. But Hamel was a good, small example of how the new all-arms tactics could work very well. John Monash, the general, the commanding, the Australian commanding, commanding the Australian forces, the General John Monash did a very good job of bringing those elements together together. Um, and demonstrating how this new uh, cooperative way of fighting warfare could work. So Hamel was on July 4 and really set the stage for the Australian advances from that point. Then on August 8 was the really big one. This really was Monash's masterpiece, not uh, not Hamel, but the, the battle on August 8, which is known uh, as the Battle of Armion, but actually took place east of Hamel. Now, the Battle of Armion on August 8, the Allied forces, the Australians and Canadians in particular, advanced about 12 kilometres on this day into the German line. So you think about the First World War with trenches and, and stalemate and static warfare. In one day, they advanced 12 kilometres on the Western Front, and that was on the 8th of August, 1918. And the Germans knew that they were a broken force at that point, and they called it the Black Day of the German Army, der Schwarze Tag. This was the day that the Germans really felt that they had suffered a fatal blow. And when we look back now, we say this was the day that the Germans lost the war. It was the 8th of August. And these attacks consider, um, continued for several days after August 8th, not quite as successful as they had been on the 8th of August. And in fact, some of them were quite unsuccessful in the following days. Yet there was still this unrelenting pressure on the Germans every day, pushing them back, pushing them back, pushing them back. And this carried on until the Australians faced the formidable obstacle of Mont Saint-Quentin and Peron, the, the town of Peron and the nearby Mont Saint-Quentin, which is really only a little hill. People visit it today and it's, it's actually hard to pick out on the landscape. It's such a small feature. But when you're on top of that hill and you look down, you have just spectacular views in every direction. And the Germans had turned Mont Saint-Quentin and the town of Peron into fortifications that were going to be very difficult to overcome. And this was John Monash being, in my opinion, potentially quite reckless, throwing in understrength Australians to take these obstacles. He wanted a very Australian victory. The one thing Monash had not had up to this point, and now we're talking the end of August 1918, as well as the, the Australians had done, they'd always been fighting cooperatively with the British and with the Canadians and the New Zealanders, and the Americans as well. John Monash wanted an Australian victory, and this he pulled off at Mont St. Quentin, but gee, it was a gamble, and gee, he was lucky because... 
it was a really formidable obstacle. The Australians could have been soundly defeated by the German defenders, but just through incredible Australian courage and determination and never saying die, they were successful at Mont St. Quentin and Perron, and it was quite an astounding victory. So it's a, the discussion about the importance of Mont St. Quentin has gone backwards and forwards in recent years. Um, some historians have said it's not as important as we make it out. I, I'm, I'm in the camp that believes it was very important. I think it was just such a great Aussie victory. And even though we don't have time for it in this podcast, certainly go back and, and, and look up the Battle of Mont St. Quentin. And I think you'll agree with me that it's quite a remarkable Australian achievement. So this brings us to the end of August and early September 1918. So we're in the closing months of the war now. The war would be over, of course, in November. So we're in the closing stages of the war. And I think by this time, everyone knew it as well. The Germans knew that the war could not be won at this point. The Americans were now taking a much bigger role in fighting, particularly in the French sector down south. The Germans knew they couldn't win the war. They started talking about negotiating for peace. The Allies knew the war was going to be over as well. But they also knew that they had to deal a decisive blow to the Germans. They had to absolutely smash them in order to convince them to capitulate. And so the Allies were determined to fight every day, every day, every day to push the Germans back as far as they could. And the Germans were determined to hold as much ground as they could for the opposite reason. They knew that the more ground they held, the better position they would have in peace negotiations. So it was a very difficult time, a very difficult time for the men on the ground and a very difficult time for the politics of the day. There was, there was so much at stake in these closing days of the, of the Battle of the War, of, the, of these battles during the, the end of the war. And so we're in September now, 1918, right at the closing stages of the war. And this is probably the toughest time that many of the Australians faced during the whole war. This was a time when the Australians were being sent in against occupied villages every day, every day, every day. They would attack a village in the morning. They would bury their dead in the local cemetery. They would eat some food, get some sleep, and the next day get up and do it all again. And this was repeated time and time and time again. We must also remember the Australians by this stage were a very weak force. Their individual members were very strong fighters, but numerically they were very, very weak. The two conscription referendums had been defeated in Australia. There just weren't enough reinforcements coming from Australia to replace the men who were being killed and wounded in so many of these big actions. And so the Australian force, a, a typical force of Australian soldiers, a battalion, the typical unit that, that we remember the Australians in, at full strength was about a 1,000 men. As the war went on and the numbers depleted and depleted and more men were killed and wounded and there were not enough replacements coming through, those numbers dropped so that by 1918, these battalions were down to either half strength or in many cases, a quarter of their strength. So 250 men instead of a 1,000. Yet they were still being sent into action as a battalion. So when you read these reports, when you read unit diaries and, and histories of the fighting in late 1918, remember that fact that when they say the 15th Battalion or the 30th Battalion went into an action and attacked the Germans, remember they're not talking about a thousand men like they would have been at Gallipoli in 1915. Now they were talking about 500 men, 400, sometimes 200. I think at Mont St. Quentin, the 17th Battalion went into battle with 170 men. That's, that's, that's like one-tenth of their full strength. So this is an important thing we have to remember about everything going on. And the Australians by this stage had evolved into a fantastic fighting force, one of the most brilliant fighting forces of the entire war. But it was incredibly tough. They just didn't have enough men to go around. So many veterans look back on this as their most awful time of the war. They were exhausted beyond telling. They were fighting every day. They were still losing men. And this great... This great paradox that they knew the war was was coming to an end. They knew it was going to be over soon. They they knew the Germans were not going to win. They knew the Allies were going to win, and yet they were still being forced to fight every day, just as hard as they had for for every other battle during the war. And lots of men were dying. And it's a it's a it's a terrible tragedy that the war went on for these extra weeks and dragged on, and uh, that so many men were killed in these closing stages. Just a really horrific time, and and as I said, if you see interviews with veterans and you you, you see the, the 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 accounts that they gave of this time, they'll just talk about how terrible it was. I've 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 heard interviews with veterans where they say that had the war gone on for another couple of weeks, they wouldn't have been able to do it. That they they would have just refused to fight or or even run away. The, it was just such a terrible time. They were at breaking point. These men. So that leads us to September in 1918 and very famous actions that took place here, the 1918 battles on the Hindenburg Line. Now, the Hindenburg Line was the German fortified position that had been captured at such great cost at Bullecourt in 1917, and the Germans had been pushed back through the old battlefields of the Somme 
back to the Hindenburg line where they dug in and then the, the Aussies and the, and the Canadians and the Americans and the British uh, took the Hindenburg line from them in late September 1918. And this was a, a really important time, as I said, for Americans fighting alongside Australians. And we have a great relationship with America as countries, but also as military partners. And it really began in these battles in September 1918. And when you visit the battlefields of the Somme and of the Western Front, you walk through this area, you'll see lots of, they're not buried in the same cemeteries, unfortunately, but you'll see lots of British and Australian graves on dates uh, that, that correspond to American burials in the American cemeteries, because the forces were fighting alongside um, and we shouldn't overlook the contribution of the Americans. It's it's it is something that does get overlooked, but uh, it is the Americans did play a very important role in these closing stages of the war, and we, we certainly shouldn't overlook that. So that's September, the the battles of the Hindenburg Line, and again the Australian forces pushing very very hard, capturing lots of villages and dying in staggering numbers at this time. The, some of the highest casualties of the war occurred in these closing stages. Just a tragic time. Thinking about the families back in Australia, getting those, getting the telegram advising their son had been killed in the the, the, the closing days of the war. In many cases. So this leads us to Mont Brahan. We're now in early October. The Australians captured several small villages in the opening days of October. And the Australians were so exhausted that the Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, had been talking to General Monash and the other commanders of the Australian force, and he knew that the Aussies were at their, had reached the end of their tether. Billy Hughes and, in fact, all the generals knew that the Aussies couldn't go on for much longer. Monash was driving them very hard. This was a very controversial time. I mean, we talk about Monash as the wonderful Australian general, and he certainly did care for his men. But if you look back at this time, Monash was pushing them harder than anyone else. And he does, I think justifiably cop a little bit of flack at this time, Monash, for pushing his men harder than he had to. The war was coming to an end, yet he was still fighting as aggressively as he had on any day. And it's a little bit controversial. I, I think it should be. I think we should remember that. We should remember that Monash did drive his men incredibly hard, and he was responsible for a lot of them being killed in these closing days of the war. So whether you agree with that or not, we should remember that as part of the historic record, that Monash was driving his men close to breaking point at this stage. And uh, we're fortunate that they, they didn't actually reach that breaking point. But Billy Hughes, the Prime Minister, aware that the Australians were close to the close to the end of what they could achieve, ordered them that they be removed from the line. And against the advice of Monash, Billy Hughes ordered that the Australians be pulled out of the line for a rest, noting how exhausted they were. And so that those da- the, the date for the Australians to be removed was set for early October. And in fact, if we look at the second division that we're going to be talking about here at Mont Brahan, they were supposed to leave the line on the 4th of October. That was supposed to be their last day in the line, and they were going to be replaced by an American unit. But due to the uh, the vagrancies of, of fighting on the Western Front and communication and transport, the Americans were delayed in reaching the Australian positions. So the Australian relief was pushed back by one day. So instead of the 4th of October, the Australians were going to be held in the line until the 5th of October. Normally not such a big deal. They'd just occupy trenches and keep their heads down and, and wait for the relief to come in the following day. But in this instance, again, a controversial decision was made by Monash. He decided that he was going to put them in for one last attack, that there was a there was a little village that stood on a plateau that had been captured by British troops on the 3rd of October, but then had been lost again in German counterattacks. And it created a little bit of a bulge in the front line. It was positioned on a high plateau and it had quite good views across the landscape. And Monash decided it would be one last action for the Australians to just pinch out this little German bulge in the line and capture this little village of Mont Brahan. It didn't really mean much. He wasn't going to put many troops in. In the grand scheme of things, it wasn't going to mean very much. But I tell you what, it meant an awful lot to the men who were tasked with attacking this village. Who were these men? Well, it was the 2nd Division, as I said. Uh, and the battalions that they picked for this were the 21st and the 24th Battalions. And these, these two battalions, even though they had fought since Gallipoli, uh, they were considered relatively fresh because they hadn't been involved in recent fighting over the, the the week or two prior to this. Now, when I say they were relatively fresh, that is a very relative term uh, because when they when they brought the two battalions together in expectation of the attack, they had less than 500 men between them. The combined force added up to less than 500 men. So this is about a quarter strength. The two battalions, when they landed at Gallipoli, had 2,000 men between them. By the end of 1918, they could barely rustle together 500. So this was going to be quite a challenge for them to, to go into the line against this fortified German village. To bolster them somewhat, knowing that they were so under strength, they did, again, something that was quite remarkable and demonstrating how desperate the fighting was at this time. They actually brought in the 2nd Pioneer Battalion to serve alongside them. Now, the Pioneers, 
exist to dig trenches, to build roads, to dig mortar pits. They 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 operate as they operate as fighting troops in the front line, but very much in support of the combat infantry. The pioneers are builders and constructors. They don't normally grab rifles and go into the assault. They'd been trained to do this. They had been trained in infantry tactics, but they were very rarely used as infantry during the war. And it just shows the desperation. Again, this was one of the few times when a pioneer force was put in uh, beside the infantry and given uh, objectives to attack alongside the infantry. So the poor old second pioneers found themselves brought up from the rear area, given rifles and, and put into the front line as well. So this was the force, the 21st, the 24th battalions and a second pioneer battalion were all lined up to go in against the, the Germans. So what was the attack like at Montbrahan? Montbrahan sits on a high plateau. So the Aussies had to attack from the village of Ramakor up a, up a not a steep slope, but a slope which gave the German defenders good observation. Uh, there was a couple of very prominent German strong points in the town that the Allies were aware of. As I said, the British had been in there only the, uh, two days before, so they knew exactly what the Australians were facing. And so in the early morning of the 5th of October, the Australians snuck their way up to a railway embankment which faced the town and then scrambled over the embankment and, and pushed on into the village. They came under fire just about as, as soon as they left the, the safety of the railway embankment. And men from the 24th Battalion who'd been featured as the, they were called the Quiru Battalion by Charles Bean in his official history. Very interesting, a battalion that he, he caught up with in the, in the village of Quiru earlier in 1918 and and wrote a lot about these men and he, he referred to them quite affectionately as the Quiru Battalion um, because he'd spent so much time with them in the rear area and they became almost to Charles Bean the typical Anzac Battalion in 1918. So they they earlier in the war, they'd, early in 1918, they'd received a lot of coverage by Charles Bean and in the press and they attacked here and uh, several of them were killed, including their commanding officer, which was very, very, uh, very sad for that battalion as they advanced and they were killed quite early in the, in the battle as well as the 24th advanced. This attack went in with a small number of tanks. It wasn't like the 8th of August or even Hamel where there was a big group of orchestrated tank formations attacking alongside the Aussies, but there were a number of tanks there to help clear strong points. This was a good thing and a bad thing. It was good because if you encountered a German strong point, you could call on a tank to come in and take care of it. But the bad thing was uh, that these tanks drew a lot of fire from the Germans. The Germans had a lot of field guns in the front line to deal with tanks, and these field guns were basically small artillery pieces designed to support infantry but the Germans realized that by fighting firing virtually straight at the tanks they were fairly effective tank weapons so a lot of Australian casualties occurred because of um, the explosions from field guns that were aimed at the tanks that were advancing alongside the Australians so a bit of a, a double-edged sword the uh, the tanks in terms of support at Montbrahan the ground wasn't particularly well suited to tank operations and the tanks gave them some support but most of the hard work was done by infantrymen with rifle and bayonet so the Australians pushed on through the town as they as they came up through the town I mentioned before a couple of very prominent German strong points the, there'd, there'd been a lot of chalk quarrying done in this area and uh, prior to the war and there were very large chalk quarries in various places on the outskirts of the town particularly south of the town the direction the Australians were attacking from and as they advanced through here, the Germans had turned those chalk quarries into strong points. And one of them on the outskirts of the town was holding up the Australian attack and it was looking like the Australians were going to get bogged down. And so a, a lieutenant from Victoria called George Ingram decided to take the Germans on himself and he basically charged in amongst the Germans in the quarry and and killed without discretion and 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 attacked the Germans quite viciously. And his men caught up to him and found him in the quarry um, with about 30 German prisoners, lots of bodies around and about nine machine guns that he had almost single-handedly captured. So the Germans mopped up that, uh, the Australians mopped up that quarry, took German prisoners, cleared the bodies out and moved on into the town. George Igram ran off again ahead of his men. His men heard a commotion and they saw him bust into a house that had been knocked down by shellfire and they rushed in behind him and found him holding another 30 Germans prisoner at pistol point in the cellar of the house and he'd killed several of them and, and taken the rest prisoner. So George Ingram was responsible, particularly in the western half of the town. He was almost a one-man offensive. He he, uh, he cleared most of the town on his own and, um, and took objectives that had been assigned pretty much for his whole battalion. And George Ingram received Victoria Cross for that action. It was the last Australian Victoria Cross of the First World War uh, received by George uh, Ingram at Montbrahan. Um, interesting story, George Ingram, and there was an article in the newspaper this week about uh, talking about his son who in 2008 sold George Ingram's VC and other medals uh, 
to pay a phone bill. He was struggling financially and decided he had to get rid of the medals and sold them at auction. And they sold for over $450,000 to an anonymous donor uh, who is considered fairly strongly to be Kerry Stokes from Channel 7, the boss of Channel 7. And Kerry Stokes had bought several Victoria Crosses at about this time. And George Ingram's Victoria Cross was bought by an anonymous donor and the same day donated to the Australian War Memorial. Uh, not not lent to the War Memorial, not not on temporary display, but donated to the War Memorial. So it now belongs to the War Memorial. It's in the permanent collection. And George Ingram's VC can now be seen in the Hall of Valour at the uh, War Memorial, which is really wonderful. It's it's certainly sad for the family that they were forced to part with the medal, but wonderful that it's ended up in the in the the love you know the wonderful institution that is the Australian War Memorial. So that was George Ingram, quite a quite a heroic man. An interesting story as well. He was married a few times. His son, who was interviewed recently of selling his medals, is only in his sixties. Uh, George Ingram had him when he was well into his sixties as well. Uh, so he was married married several times. He had children quite late in life, and his wife, his third wife, only passed away relatively recently in the last few years. Uh, so we lost when she when she passed away a few years ago. We lost a remarkable connection, which was the widow of a First World War Victoria Cross winner. So strange times that that we're now moving into this era when we don't have these personal connections with these people. But that um, not getting too uh, nostalgic about it. But uh, I feel I feel very sad personally that we we've moved on now. That there's no people left that that we can talk to about these great actions. And and when George Ingram's wife. Uh, died a few years ago. That was really uh, the final um, connection with the, the First World War Victoria Cross winners, gone forever. But that was George Ingram, did very well. So the Australians by now are pushing on. By very early in the morning, by nine o'clock or so, the Australians had completed the capture of the village, a remarkable achievement to to capture the village. Um, really extraordinary. You, you would not expect that such a small force, you know, 500-odd men would, would do so well in capturing the village. They took about 400 German prisoners, inflicted lots of casualties, lots of machine guns. They captured some field guns that had been shooting at tanks. Quite a remarkable achievement of the Australians. Like once again, just, just amazing how effective they were, pulling off impossible tasks, left, right and centre. By this stage, the Aussies really were a very impressive fighting force and we should be very proud of what they'd done. A couple of other people, I mentioned George Ingram, a couple of other people that should be mentioned, captains Harry Fletcher and Austin Mahoney. What a wonderful story, these two men. Both mates from Victoria, both enlisted as privates in 1915 and served at Gallipoli together. Served in the 24th Battalion at Gallipoli together. During the course of the war, they both were promoted through the ranks until eventually they became company commanders. By 1918, they were leading companies. They were both captains. They both won the military cross. Just great achievers, wonderful Australian story. And good mates they were, both commanding separate companies at Montbrahan, having served since Gallipoli. Very early in the attack, I mentioned that the Australians were advancing alongside tanks. And as Harry Fletcher, the captain and commander of one of the, uh, one of the companies, was directing the tank and, and telling it which direction to go to, to, uh, towards a German strong point, a shell from a German field gun landed next to the tank and killed several men, including Harry Fletcher which was a great tragedy. And Harry Fletcher is today buried in the village of Montbrahan, not far from where he directed that uh, that attack. And then later in the morning, his mate, Austin Mahoney, was helping the men to dig in, consolidating the position. They'd captured the village. He was telling them where to set up machine guns and just consolidating the Australian positions. And a distant machine gun, very far away, just fired a random burst at the Australians. And he was hit in the head. And just a just an unlucky shot just, just caught him he was hit in the head. He was wounded very badly. His men carried him back to a dressing station, uh, but he unfortunately could not be saved, and he died the following day. And so Austin Mahoney and Harry Fletcher, the two mates from Victoria who had fought together since Gallipoli as privates, both killed on the last day of fighting on the Western Front. Just a tragic story. And I, I've told this story many times, and I tell it whenever I'm on the battlefields, and I'd love to be able to stand in that cemetery with the two graves side by side, but unfortunately... They're not buried together, even though they enlisted together and trained together and fought together and died not very far away from each other. Unfortunately, they're not buried together. Austin Mahoney is buried in uh, Tincor Cemetery uh, behind the lines on the Somme a little bit further back and next to the hospital where he died. But look up their story, Harry Fletcher and Austin Mahoney. Just a, there's, a, there's a great photograph of the two of them together, uh, which was taken just before they were killed. So just a really wonderful um, story and a tragic, tragic story. Killed on the last day of fighting. Just can't believe it. I couldn't believe it when I... 
when I read that for the first time and when I was doing research for my book, Walking with the Anzacs, I was doing a section at the back is the in memoriam section, which was in memoriam sections in the newspaper began during the First World War because people wanted to remember on the anniversaries of losing their family members and their mates during the war. They wanted to post memories and there's a, there's a heartbreaking one from 1919 in uh, one of the Victorian papers, just one of their fellow officers just, just talking about Harry and Austin uh, both killed on the last day of fighting of the AF in France. Just, just, a, just a tragic story. The, the a small story which represents the larger tragedy of what was going on in 1918. So that was really the Battle of Montbrahan. There's, there's not a lot to say about it from a tactical point of view. There was nothing particularly innovative about anything that went on. It was just Aussies just fighting hard as they'd done for weeks and months and years previously, just demonstrating what a great fighting force they were. And there was nothing strategically important about what was going on. That little village was never going to make a big difference to the outcome of the war. It would have been swept up in the advances that followed, the British advances and the American and Canadian advances that took over from the Aussies. They they captured all of that ground and, and much beyond. So that village would have been swept up in those big advances. So it, it begs the question, the controversy that still hovers over Mont Brahan. You can't get away from it, the controversy. Should the Aussies have even been there? The Aussies were not supposed to be there. They were dug in in front of the village on the 4th of October. They were supposed to be relieved by the Americans that day. And through no fault of the Americans, they were not there in time, just that the, the, the American Relief Division couldn't get there in time to relieve the Australians, so they pushed it back by a day. But Monash has to face some blame here. The Aussies lost 400 men in the, the, the capture of Mont Brahan, and several of those, a surprisingly high number, were Gallipoli veterans. veterans. Several dozen of the men killed at Mont Brahan had served at Gallipoli. And so you have to ask the question, should the Australians have even been there? It didn't really achieve much. Even Charles Bean in the official history basically said that the he, he questions whether the attack needed to take place. And Charles Bean even says in the official history that it seems that the attack took place just to keep the troops occupied, just to give them something to do on their final day in the line. And I do agree with that. It does seem that the attack was not particularly important but it was simply a case of Monash saying, well, we've got some we've got some Aussies here in the line. There's a village to be captured, so let's capture it. Um, so rightly or wrongly, it was a great Australian victory, but I, I, every time I'm there and every time I think about it, I can't help but think about men like Harry Fletcher and Austin Mahoney and their 400 comrades who didn't make it home, um, many of whom had served since Gallipoli. So again, just something to think about. And when I walk the ground at Mont Brahan, I've been visiting Mont Brahan for 20 years now and when I walk the ground, I, just, I, I can't help but think of those people that, that so many men died in this last day of, of, of fighting. And it's really quite a remarkable place. It seems a long way away from anywhere. It takes a long time to get there. It's not close to Pozier or Villas Bretno or any of the other famous Australian battles, battlefields that most people visit. It's just this isolated, small little village uh, a long way from anywhere where a lot of Australians died on this last day of fighting. So it's a controversial battle. We, we should be proud of what the Australians achieved, but we should also ask questions about what uh, you know the, the point of it and whether they were even supposed to be there. Brings me neatly to finish up talking about Mont Brahan today because I would encourage everyone, if you go to the Western Front, don't just go to Villas Bretonneux, don't just go to Pozier, don't just go to Ypres and Bullecourt and Passchendaele. I mean, definitely go to those places. Go to Fromel and go, go to all these places. You, you really should. They're, they're wonderful Australian sites, but spend some time if you can find the time. Go east, go east into this this eastern area of the battlefields. It's about an hour or so away from probably where you're going to stay, so it's a little bit of a drive, but you can do it in half a day. Go and explore it. Take your hire car and just go and drive around. And there's not a lot to see from the war. You'll you go to villages like Mont Brahan and you'll see or Bellacore or Bellinglees or all these other villages in the area where Australians fought. You'll see you won't see trenches and you won't see German pillboxes. What you will see is cemeteries. The the towns were not particularly badly damaged during the fighting because the fighting just swept through very quickly. And so the Australians, as I said, would come through, attack, push the Germans out, and then bury their mates in the local cemetery. And so that's what you will find there. You'll find cemeteries, small, isolated, often quite beautiful cemeteries containing a very high proportion of Australian casualties. And when you see these late dates, when you see late September 1918, you see early October, then you see up to the 5th of October, or even sometimes later if these men died of wounds, you just can't help but think about it, fighting since Gallipoli, you know, fighting for more than three years and now in this tiny little corner of France, just such a long way from home and just really a, a quite a tragic end. 
we should remember them and we should be very proud of what they achieved. But we should also remember the tragedy of what went on there. That they, you know, each each man in lying in a cemetery represents a, a grieving family back in Australia. And 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 how how tragic to lose your son or brother or husband in the closing days of the war to to be still freshly grieving the the wounds of having heard about the death of your son still so fresh and then a few days later hearing that the war was over and that if he just hung in for another week or two he could have come home to you tragic stuff you can't help but think about it i'm getting a little bit emotional talking about it but you can't you can't help but think of these things when you when you walk this ground and people don't walk this ground if you go to montbrahan you will not see another australian you the, the french people there will be very grateful to see you and a little bit confused as to why you've come all the way out there but Definitely do it. If you get over there, walk the ground in this area. The department is called the Aisne, A-I-S-N-E, the Aisne. It's east of the Somme, um, and I strongly recommend you get out there and, and walk the ground because it's really quite special. And in Montbrahan, there's a surprising amount to see, considering that the fighting literally only lasted a few hours in Montbrahan. It's amazing what you can see there. And I was really proud when I went there to do my first, long before I did Walking with the Anzacs, my first real trip there. I was walking the ground and had read a couple of reports that there was nothing left to see from the war. And I remember coming around, walking down this farm track, coming around a corner, and there was a little farmhouse in the corner of the road. And there in front of it in the field was this huge, irregular depression. And I instantly knew what it was as soon as I saw it. I went, that's the quarry where George Ingram won the Victoria Cross. And I went up and inspected it more closely, and absolutely it was. It was the quarry. It's still there. So over the centuries, they dug chalk out of this big hole in the field. Uh, and the Germans had turned it into a fortified position, and now nature has reclaimed it somewhat. It's grassed over, but it's unmistakable. It's it's a large depression in the ground, it's still very deep. You could fall into it and hurt yourself. It's still a large depression in the ground, and this was the quarry where George Ingram won the Victoria Cross. And I was quite astounded to to find that, and very proud that I I found it when I put that in Walking with the Anzacs. That was one of my proudest achievements in that book. Um, I believe that any time you write a book, it should add something new to the collect collective knowledge, and that was one of my proud achievements to be able to put in there that. The quarry where George Ingram won that Victoria Cross is still there, and it's quite a quite a remarkable moment when that occurred. And I always feel very a very strong connection to the men of the AAF when I visit that site and stand next to that quarry. There's uh, several other quarries in the outskirts of the town as well that were also fought over, and that you can read about in the official history and the tough fighting that occurred there. There they still remain. And I mentioned that the Aussies attacked from behind the railway embankment that ran around the town, and that railway embankment is still there. The, the railway itself is long gone, but the embankment is still there, and it's now a, a track that people use for walking and riding their bike and riding their horses. And you can walk along the railway embankment in the footsteps of the Aussies, and the railway embankments were key features of this attack on Montbrahan because really in these open fields, this was the only protection the troops had, particularly in the early stages of the advance. So the railway embankment is still there, and interestingly, the uh, as I walked along the rail embankment uh, one of, on one of my early visits, and um, I was I was thinking, well, there must be a railway station somewhere in the town, because the reports talked about how the Australian troops, when they captured Montbrahan, there was a German train still in the station, loaded up with beer and supplies, and the Aussies were very happy to find all these supplies in the Montbrahan railway station. I've seen photos of it. I've seen black and white photos of the railway station, and as I walked through the town, I thought, well, it must still be here somewhere. Even though trains no longer run to Montbrahan, the town was not destroyed during the war. It received a few shell hits, but it wasn't very badly knocked around. So I thought there must be a railway station here somewhere. And as I walked along that railway embankment, I walked past a house and looking back at the house, I noticed that there was a very sloped roof, which looked a lot like a train platform and even a little signal box out in the garden. And that I realised straight away that was the old train station. The, the trains have not run for decades in Montbrahan, so they've converted it into a house, the old railway station. And it's at uh, the, the, the first house in the street that, that becomes the railway embankment. So that's the old railway station that the Australians captured and, and were happy to fill themselves up with beer. And then across the road as well was an old, uh, was it, well, what's today is a pharmacy, but with the words hotel written above the door. So that was the <laughs> typical back in the, the, the 19th century to have a train station uh, with a hotel immediately across the road. And so those, uh, those two buildings are still there in Montbrahan representing the you know a very good connection with the Australians who were there and and had captured the town. So there's, there there is quite a bit to see and and I'd mentioned the cemeteries. There's two very special cemeteries to see. There's there's actually three within the the grounds of of the the surrounds of Montbrahan. There is Calvair Cemetery uh, in within the town, which is really quite a lovely spot. A lot of Australians buried there. Most of them killed in the attack on Montbrahan. Uh, that's where Harry Fletcher the the captain I mentioned earlier is buried. He's buried in Calvair Cemetery. 
uh, and a couple of quite a few decorated Australians. And when you think about it, it makes sense that the Aussies that were f- killed at this time had been fighting for a long time, so they'd had lots of opportunities to receive gallantry awards. So there's a lot of military medals there. There's several DCMs. There's two or three Australians who won the DCM, the Distinguished Conduct Medal, which is only one level below the Victoria Cross, and some really interesting stories. You can read more about it in Walking with the Anzacs. I talk about the specific burials uh, in each of those uh, those cemeteries. But the cemetery that I think is the most special to visit is called High Tree Cemetery, and it's on the eastern outskirts of Mont Brahan. And I always go to High Tree Cemetery because... I mean, this is something I came up with and you might think it's it makes sense or you might think it's a little bit odd. But to me, it's a really symbolic cemetery because it's the easternmost cemetery on Australia's easternmost battlefield of the war. Now, there are other Australians buried further east. There were Australians that were wounded and captured by the Germans, for example, and then perhaps died on their way back to a prison camp in Germany. There are many Australians who died while serving in prison camps in Germany. Uh, who are buried in Germany from the First World War. So I'm not saying that there aren't more easterly Australian burials. However, this is a battlefield cemetery, the most easterly battlefield cemetery on Australia's last battlefield of the war. So it's it's really, for me, it's really symbolic and it's a place I like to go. And actually, I've got Walking with the Anzacs in front of me and I'm going to look this up while I, while I talk to you about it because it's quite significant. There's a significant grave there, uh, which I'm about to look up as we talk. And... The important thing about this cemetery is as the most easterly cemetery on Australia's most easterly battlefield, in many ways I feel that this is where the journey ended for the AOF. This, when you stand in that spot, and particularly in front of the grave of um, Private Taylor in this, uh, in this cemetery, so Private Charles Bateman and Joseph Taylor of the Second Pioneers are both buried here, and Private Taylor's grave is the most easterly in the cemetery. So he was killed on the 5th of October in, as part of the Second Pioneers during the Battle of Mont Brahan, and his is the most easterly grave in the most easterly cemetery of Australia's last battlefield of the war. So I, I, I love to stand there and just contemplate the whole thing. I mean, I've been to Gallipoli many times. I've, I've been to all the battlefields of the Western Front, and just to stand there and think, this is where the journey ended. This is where Private Taylor represents the 61,000 Australians killed during the First World War and, and that incredible journey of highs and lows and mateship and courage and sacrifice and all those things we remember every Anzac Day started on the shores of Anzac Cove on the 25th of April 1915 and ended at Private Taylor's grave on the 5th of October 1918. And it's a... It's a poignant place. It's a, it's an emotional place. Go there. Go to High Tree Cemetery. Stand in front of Private Taylor's grave and, and just think about what it means. I guarantee you'll shed a tear and, and it's a memory that will stay with you for a very long time as it has done for, for me since the first time I visited it. So that's the story of Mont Brahan, a small battle but important that we remember it this week on the 100th anniversary. This really brings to an end the centenaries. We've, we've still got Remembrance Day coming up, obviously, in November, the, the centenary of the end of the war, which is an important symbolic date, but not a, not a particularly relevant date for Australians. They were not fighting on the 11th of November, uh, but it's obviously going to be wonderful to remember the end of the war. But I think this week, this has been the important week when Australia's fighting came to an end, on the Western Front at least, at this little village of Mont Brahan. It's a wonderful story. It's, it's filled with wonderful characters, a great deal of tragedy and controversy, and I really... I really implore you that if you go to the battlefields, take the time, go where other people don't go, go east, go into the AIM department, visit these battlefields and visit the battlefield of Mont Brahan. It's, it's a wonderful place and I guarantee you will not regret it. Thank you for joining me for this discussion about the Battle of Mont Brahan. I'll be back in future weeks with more great history, but for now, thanks very much for listening. <laughs>